Adventures in American Literature, Spanish Explorers in the Americas. During the 16th century, Spain sent several expeditions to explore, conquer, and colonize the Americas. Fortunately, narratives of these expeditions have survived. The Relacion of Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, first published in 1542, is an extraordinary document of American exploration. Cabeza de Vaca was a member of an expedition that set sail in June 1527 for Florida. The journey was dogged by misfortunes. Two ships were wrecked, men deserted, many died. Finally, Cabeza de Vaca and his small party were shipwrecked on a narrow island off the coast of Texas. His narrative reveals the great hardships these men endured between 1528 and 1536 as they walked across Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona before reaching Mexico. In the following excerpt from his narrative, Cabeza de Vaca tells of the extreme privations he and his companions suffered while they were living among the Avavaras and Arbados. The text given here is based on the translation by Thomas Buckingham Smith, which was edited by John Shea and published with editions in 1871. I've already stated that throughout all this country we went naked, and as we were unaccustomed to being so, twice a year we cast our skins like serpents. The sun and air produced great sores on our breasts and shoulders, giving us sharp pain, and the large loads we had, being very heavy, caused the cords to cut into our arms. The country is so broken and thick-set that often, after getting our wood in the forests, the blood flowed from us in many places, caused by the obstruction of thorns and shrubs that tore our flesh wherever we went. At times, when my turn came to get wood, after it had cost me much blood, I could not bring it out either on my back or by dragging. In these labors, my only solace and relief were in thinking of the sufferings of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and the blood he shed for me, in considering how much greater must have been the torment he sustained from the thorns than that I there received. I bartered with these Indians in combs that I made for them and in bows, arrows, and nets. We made ha we made mats, which are their houses that they have great necessity for, and although they know how to make them, they wish to give their full time to getting food, since when otherwise employed, they are pinched with hunger. Sometimes the Indians would set me to scraping and softening skins, and the days of my greatest prosperity there were those which they gave me skins to dress. I would scrape them a very great deal and eat the scraps, which would sustain me two or three days. When it happened among these people, as it had likewise among others whom we left behind, that a piece of meat was given us, we ate it raw. For if we had put it to roast, the first native that should come along would have taken it off and devoured it, and it appeared to us not well to expose it to this risk. Besides, we were in such condition it would have given us pain to eat it roasted, and we could not have digested it so well as raw. Such was the life that we spent there, and the meager subsistence we earned by the matters of traffic, which were the work of our hands. Between 1539 and 1542, Hernando de Soto led an expedition through the Gulf States. An eyewitness account of this expedition was written by a gentleman from Elvis, a town in Portugal, and published in 1557. In the following passage, he records the crossing of the Mississippi, the River Grande. Members of the expedition included Juan de Guzman and Francisco Maldonado. There was little maize in the place, and the governor moved to another town, half a league from the Great River, where it was found in sufficiency. He went to look at the river and saw that near it there was much timber of which paraguas might be made, and a good situation which the camp might be placed. 
He directly moved, built houses, and settled on a plain, a crossbow shot from the water, bringing together there all the maize of the towns behind, that at once they might go to work and cut down trees for sawing out planks to build barges. During the thirty days that were passed there, four paraguas were built, into three of which, one morning, three hours before daybreak, the governor ordered twelve cavalry to enter, four in each, men in whom he had confidence that they would gain the land notwithstanding the Indians, and secure the passage or die. He also sent some crossbowmen of foot with them, and in the other paragua, oarsmen to take them to the opposite shore. He ordered Juan de Guzman to cross with the infantry, of which he had remained captain in the place of Francisco Maldonado, and because the current was stiff, they went up along the side of the river a quarter of a league, and in passing over, they were carried down, so as to land opposite the camp. But before arriving there, at twice the distance of a stone's cast, the horsemen rode out from the paraguas to an open area of hard and even ground, which they all reached without accident. So soon as they had come to shore, the paraguas returned, and when the sun was up, two hours high, the people had had all had got all over. The distance was near half a league. A man was standing on the shore could not be told whether he were a man or something else from the other side. The stream was swift and very deep, the water always flowing turbidly, brought along from above many trees and much timber, driven onward by its force. Between 1540 and 1542, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado led an expedition from Mexico into the southwest in search of the seven cities of Cibola, fabled for their great wealth. Coronado reached the Pueblo tribes of the southwest, the Grand Canyon, and the Great Plains. A record of, hit of this expedition was kept by Pedro de Castaneda, a soldier in Coronado's army whose narrative was not published until the 19th century. In the following excerpt, he describes the Indian villages of the Pueblos. In general, these villages all have the same habits and customs, although some have some things in particular which others have not. They are governed by the opinions of the elders. They all work together to build the villages, the women being engaged in making the mixture and the walls, while the men bring the wood and put it in place. They also have no lime, but they make a mixture of ashes, coal, and dirt, which is almost as good as the mortar. For when the house is to have four stories, they do not make the walls more than a half a yard thick. The young men live in the estufas, which are in the yards of the village. They are the underground, square or round, with pine pillars. Some were seen with twelve pillars and with four in the center, as large as two men could stretch around. They usually had three or four pillars. The floor was made of large, smooth stones, like the baths which they have in Europe. They have a hearth made like the binnacle or compass of a ship in which they burn a handful of time a handful of time at a, at a time to keep up the heat and they can stay in there just as in a bath the top was on a level with the ground some that were seen were large enough for a game of ball when any man wishes to marry it has to be arranged by those who govern the man has to spin and weave a blanket and place it before the woman who covers herself with it and becomes his wife. The houses belong to the women, the estufas to the men. If a man repudiates his woman, he has to go to the estufa. It is forbidden for women to sleep in the estufas or to enter these for any purpose except to give their husbands or sons something to eat. The men spin and weave. The women bring up the children and prepare the food. 